Good evening all. Welcome to the interesting case of the month. We will see an interesting fetal MRI case. So before going to the history, I want to tell you about a new channel that is Ratlin, which is run by Dr. Dipanshu Sharma from AIMS. So where radiological and clinicological correlation of cases are done, I will provide the link in the description of the video. So please do subscribe to his channel. Coming to the clinical history, a 26 year female with history of 9 months of amenorrhea referred to fetal MRI. Antenatal ultrasound showed ecogenic mass lesion in the fetal brain in routine growth scan and it was suspected to be fetal intracranial neoplasm. She is known case of hypothyroidism and PAH on treatment. Obstetric history, she is G3, P1, L1 and A1. First pregnancy, female baby was female baby and now she is 10 years. Second is a spontaneous abortion. Third is the present pregnancy where there is history of spotting per vaginum in first trimester and she is using ecosprint till then, till now. So drug history, tablet ecosprin 75 mg OD since 2 months, tablet Theranom for hypothyroidism, previous history of injections of progesterone beta HCG in 2nd to 4th month, torch profile was unavailable and there is no history of infections, rash or skin lesions. Laboratory parameters showed thrombocytopenia in mother, rest were normal. So these are the ultrasound images you can see there is a clearly ecogenic lesion noted in the lateral ventricle which is extending into the periventricular location and central somewhere. There is associated hydrocephalus that is dilated bilateral lateral ventricles. On color Doppler there is no significant vascularity, no significant color uptake or vascularity noted within the lesion. This is at the level of circle of villus. You can see the again you can see there is hydrocephalus. There is extension of the lesion into the lateral ventricles with associated dilatation of lateral ventricles. And even the kidneys there is mild dilated PCS and there is persistent fetal distended bladder in this case. Next coming to this is the video you can see this is the ecogenic lesion which is seen in the left lateral ventricle which is extending into the capsogangler region and even into the periventricular location and central semioval associated with hydrocephalus and even there is ecogenic component also noted in the fourth ventricle and cisterna magna. Next this is the other video where you can see the color doppler you can see there is no significant color uptake or vascularity noted within the lesion. This is the circle of illness and even in the spectral Doppler you can see there is reversal of the diastolic waveforms. So there is reversal of diastolic waveforms in fetal MCA in this case. Next so Doppler ultrasound findings I have seen there is ecogenic lesion in the ventricle with periventricular extension. There is reversal or in diastolic velocity in of the middle cerebral artery. There is dilated fetal PCS and persistent distant bladder in this case. Fetal heart rate tracing indicated poor beat to beat variability or arrhythmias. So coming to the differentials we can consider in this case basing upon the ultrasound findings that is differential diagnosis of ecogenic lesions in fetal brain. Most common is fetal intracranial hemorrhage. Others are fetal intracranial tumors such as teratoma followed by astrocytoma, craniopharyngioma or peanuts that is primary neuroectodermal tumors, fetal, fetal intracranial infections, fetal intracranial calcifications, lipoma of carpus callosum and even choroid plexus lesions or neoplasms. These are the, all the differential diagnosis. So next the patient was referred to MRI. You can see there is heterogeneously hyperintense lesion on T2 which is extending into the left lateral ventricle and even into the periventricular location and central semioval. Here it is also extending into the capsuloganglionic region and it is also seen there is associated hydrocephalus and this is the sagittal and coronal and sagittal weighted images you can see there is intraventricular extension with hydrocephalus. Next uh, these are the hash sequ Fista sequences you can see the lesion is heterogeneously hyper intense associated with hydrocephalus and even intraventricular extension and the sagittal sections you can see there is intraventricular extension with associated hydrocephalus coronal sequences. Next on DWA you can see there is patchy restricted diffusion on DWA within the lesion. On T1 FS sequences you can see this is the lesion is predominantly hyper intense on T1 with even hyper intense areas noted in the lateral ventricles associated with hydrocephalus and this is the key sequence that is GRE sequence which depicts uh, hemorrhage or blooming. You can see the lesion is showing significant blooming on GRE. Even there is blooming in the lateral ventricles associated with hydrocephalus. Even there is blooming on GR in the fourth ventricle. There is blooming on GR in the cisterna magna. 
and there is also blooming in GRE along the FAX and even in the sulci in right hyperatal lobe. So this GRE typically clinches the diagnosis that this is a fetal intracranial hemorrhage rather than a fetal neoplasm. So these are the MRI findings we have already, already seen that is heterogeneously hyperintense lesion in the left capsular region extending into left periventricular deep white matter, left centrosome oil. There is intraventricular extension with hydrocephalus. The lesion is predominantly hyperintense on T1 with blooming suggestion of intracranial hemorrhage. And there is even intraventricular extension with hemorrhage and hydrocephalus. And there is hemorrhage along the FAX and even SAH in right hyperatal lobe. So what is the fetal intracranial hemorrhage? The fetal intracranial hemorrhage is more common after second trimester and it is more common in males. Left-sided unilateral lesions are more common than right-sided ones. And even warm sign, this is the new sign you have to remember, warm sign in fetus in first trimester, which is a new sonographic marker which detects risk of fetal intracranial hemorrhage in second or third trimester. And also remember grade 3 and grade 4 with brain parenchyma involvement or interventricular involvement or interventricular hemorrhage have poor prognosis than grade 1 and grade 2. Fetal MRI can better diagnose and help in grading fetal intracranial hemorrhages better than ultrasound and Doppler. So this is the warm sign in fetus. You can see these are the bilayered structures were seen floating in the freely in the CSS spaces in the early trimester. So this is the nothing but the warm. So whenever you see this warm sign or warm like structures in the fetal brain, this is the warm sign. There is increased risk of fetal hemorrhage in the subsequent pregnancies. So this is the journal you can refer. I have posted in the reference site. So new sign, remember warm sign in fetus which is a new sonographic marker which detects impending hemorrhage or increased risk of hemorrhage in later trimesters. Next, what are the causes of fetal intracranial hemorrhage? Various causes of fetal intracranial hemorrhage. One is mechanical trauma either due to maternal blood, maternal abdominal blunt or birth trauma, severe fetal hypoxia, fetal infections, fetal thrombocytopenia like congenital factor 10 and factor 5 deficiencies, even aspirin induced fetal intracranial hemorrhages, maternal thrombocytopenia that is alloimmune or idiopathic thrombocytopenia, Von Willebrand disease or even specific medications we have to ask about the history of specific medications in the pregnancy that is warfarin or cocaine abuse and even aspirin. Hem and even remember hemorrhage into fetal intracranial tumor, arteriovenous malformations, twin twin transfusion syndrome and demise of cotin. In this case there is no mechanical trauma, there is no history of hypoxia and fetal infections or there is no history of rash or skin rash and there is a history of aspirin induced fetal aspirin usage in this case. So one of the cause may be aspirin induced fetal intracranial hemorrhage and there is thrombocytopenia mother. So other cause may be alloimmune or idiopathic thrombocytopenia in the fetus. And tumor is ruled out, AV malformation is also ruled out and this is not a twin pregnancy. So what is this fetal and neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia? Fetal and neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia which is F9 is the most common cause of intracranial hemorrhage in term born in infants. Aspirin during pregnancy is also associated with increased postpartum bleeding and postpartum hematoma and it is also associated with fetal or neonatal intracranial hemorrhage. So when offering aspirin during pregnancy, the risk needs to be weighed against the potential benefits. There is a risk of increased neonatal intracranial hemorrhage was observed by Raya Hasty et al. in 2020 study, 21 study. The majority of ICH bleedings occurred by the end of second trimester. Possible interventions to reduce the risk of intracranial hemorrhage need to be introduced before 20, 20th week of gestation. The majority of ICH cases occurred in firstborn child and in male child. And most ICH cases will therefore not be recognized in time for treatment. IV immunoglobulin treatment should be considered during the subsequent pregnancy to protect or prevent ICH in subsequent pregnancies because IV immunoglobulin treatment will reduce the risk from 79% from to reported 11%. So what is the summary and take home message from this case? So fetal intracranial hemorrhage is the most common ecogenic lesions we can see in ultrasound and they are better diagnosed than MRI during second trimester. Fetal intracranial hemorrhage is most common in males. Left sided unilateral lesions are more common than right sided ones. Fetal intracranial hemorrhage is common than fetal intracranial neoplasms if the ecogenic mass or lesion is detected in the second or late trimesters because fetal intracranial neoplasms are detected mostly in the early trimester or first trimesters. Grade 3 and grade 4 have poor prognosis than grade 1 and grade 2. Fetal distended bladder with distended PCS and reversal of diastolic waves of MCA are, are indirect markers in suspected case of ICH or IVH. Warm sign in fetus as we have seen is a new sonographic marker for increased risk of fetal intracranial hemorrhage in later trimesters. Even fetal MRI usually diagnoses better in case fetal intracranial hemorrhage than ultrasonography and Doppler. And remember important point T1FS 
DWA and GRE and SWA sequence are key sequences to be considered and not to be missed in fetal MRI in all suspicious cases of fetal intracranial hemorrhage or in ecogenic masses or lesions which are detected in ultrasound and referred to MRI. These are all the references. Thank you all.